I would like to thank um, um, the organizers for getting me here. It's uh, really my great pleasure to be here sharing my work. I'd like to thank you all for coming and I have some exciting um, data to share with you. And I would start from my journey about um, like tackling HIV persistence, but in the, in the middle, you will find out that most parts of my work is actually intrigued a lot by um, Lisa, Jim, and Thor's um, like study on clonal expansion. So it's really great. I'm so, so excited to be here. So I was training um, as a clinician in Taiwan, and then like my parents just don't, just don't understand why I just give up this clinician track and why I'm working on all these like bench science, and then they just have no idea why I'm doing this. So actually what I think myself is doing is that if the nature gives us a challenge, we can just fight back and we'll find the answer. This is ID4. So if there's an alien coming to us, we will be able to just design a virus or just fight them back. So this is the goal of my life as a scientist. So we know, oh, do you have the, yeah, this is, well, you don't see the title at all. Who knows? Yeah. Okay, let's see if we can. Hmm. Uh, uh, we'll see. Well, I will probably just read all the title to you. So, or I will hide my data. It's so nice. Ah, now you know my data. I'm so sorry. But, but <laughs> you will block certain parts of my data, which is still okay. All right. So HIV persists in the latent reservoir as a major barrier to cure. So why? Untreated HIV will lead to um, AIDS, but fortunately we have these, let me click this again. But fortunately we have antiviral viral therapy, so all HIV infected individuals can have undetectable viral load. However, whenever they stop antiviral viral therapy, the virus will rebound. So this is because HIV resides in the latent reservoir. The goal of CD4 T cells is that when the antigen comes in, the CD4 T cells will become activated. However, HIV preferentially infects these activated CD4 T cells and they integrate into a chromosome. And the goal of these CD4 T cells is that once the antigen is gone, they will go back to this memory resting state. And HIV living inside these memory CD4 T cells will go into this resting state with them and they do not express any viral proteins to be recognized, so cytotide T lymphocytes or ART doesn't do anything to these cells. What is even worse, that these cells can undergo homozygous proliferation or antigen-driven proliferation, so these HIV-infected cells actually expand and increase over time. Once the body encounters this antigen again, HIV will rebound, and this is why we cannot cure HIV infection. A while ago, Bob and Janet conducted a study to understand if the patient is taking antiviral viral therapy and just wait until these latent reservoir to decay, how long would it take? Oh, it would actually take probably 73 years for the patient to be cured of HIV. So therefore, all HIV infected individuals have to take antiviral viral therapy for their lifetime, which is okay, because nowadays the antiviral viral therapy is not as toxic as we thought about. However, if we think about 36 million people currently living with HIV, they're all fighting against adherence, they're fighting against adversity fast and stigma. We do hope to get an easier way or another way to cure HIV infection. This is not an easy task. There are challenges. The first challenge is that there's only one in a million C4 T cells which contain the infectious HIV. These are the cells that we want to target, but they're just so rare of them. Around 100 to 1,000 per million C4 T cells contain defective HIV. And there's no marker which can identify these two cells separately or to distinguish them from uninfected cells. Therefore, we don't know how to target them. So we started this journey for, by using a molecular virologist approach to look at these HIV proviruses, one provirus at a time to understand what they do. This is my pre PhD work with Fox and Cano. We developed this native PCR to do limiting dilution full length, which would provide PCR to look at all these, the, all these proviruses in the patient's cells. And we found that um, the majority of these proviruses are actually defective due to APOBAC mediated hypermutations, creating lots of premature stop codons in their genome, or large internal deletions encompassing major parts of the, the genome, making these proviruses defective. Or the packaging signal deletions, which obliterates this major splice donor site or these packaging signals required to make um, productive virions or other point mutations. 
So most of these proviruses are defective. However, these defective proviruses, we found that they have intact promoter functions and they're capable of making viral protein productions and they do not have any promoter CPG methylation or epigenetic silencing marker indicating that they are fully competent to produce this uh, viral particles um, to induce a CDAT cell um, response in an immune activation. So the first lesson we know is that if we only take HIV DNA quantification purely just to measure the size of the reservoir, it may not be correct because we will measure the vast majority of these defective proviruses. Second, we know there are lots of defective proviruses. We want to know what they do. So we reconstructed these defective proviruses containing patching signal deletions, hypermutations, and large internal deletions. So just reconstruct them in vitro to see whether they can make any viral proteins. So first, we want to see if they are transcribed. So when we transpect these defective proviruses into primary C4 T cells using an array of RNA measurements such as cell-associated HIV RNA is total or single immobile splice ones or supernatant HIV RNA, we found that these defective proviruses can make readily temporal amount of RNA um, in cell-associated in the supernatant. Therefore, what we learned is that in clinical trials, we do use these cell-associated RNA as a marker to measure latency reversal. However, we should take these cell-associated RNA levels as a marker for latency reversal or LTR function. If we use this purely to represent the size of the latent reservoir, some of them will be coming from defective proviruses. Next, we want to know whether these proviruses can be translated. So we reconstructed these defective proviruses, and we found that they can, um, they can, have, they can produce intracellular, intracellular gag, as shown by intracellular gag staining, or they can make supernated P24, as detected by ELISA. Here, I want to show you um, what we found. We typically look at these um, viral production using P24 ELISA using a very non-sensitive assay. It's a typical perkin elmer assay that we would be using. This assay is totally non-sensitive. You need to have 250,000 copies of virions to be detected. Okay, it's not sensitive. So when we look at them, we look at nanograms of P24 per mil, and then we look at these increase in log scale. If we see a two log increase, and then we say this is making a certain level of replication competent viruses. Right, in the recent paper, I'm dem trying to demonstrate a cell marker called C32A, which can predict um, the presence of the latent reservoir. When we look at their viral algorithms data, they use a super sensitive P24 assay to look at picograms, of, picograms per mil of, of our algorithm in the supernatant, which is okay. The problem is that the level they detect is very low, which is also okay, but then the scale that they have is actually a linear scale. Whenever we see linear scale on a biologically exponential process, we just feel, hmm, how are we going to interpret this? So we're usually skeptical if you plot these um, things in the linear scale. So look at these data that they have. This is six nanograms or 0.02 nanograms. They call this to be replication competent. And recently there has been data showing that um, this this data set's not reproduced in other studies. One of the reasons explaining this is that although they're super sensitive P24 ELISA that can measure the plasma um, protein levels, it's probably okay, but in the cell culture system, when you have lots of like var virions like releasing from the dead cells, and then this could complicate your, your real measurement. So the goal of this viral outgrowth assay, the initial spirit was that we want to capture uh, exponential growth. It is not how sensitive your assay is. It was the exponential growth that we define an infectious process. So defective proviruses may make proteins, um, which is bothersome. What about these intact proviruses? So we can identify, so we can put these cells into culture and after two or three weeks, um, they do not grow any virus in the P24 negative culture wells. So we took those wells and take a look at these proviruses. What do they look like? And to our surprise, lots of them are actually looking very intact. So what, what does it mean by intact? They have intact open reading frames throughout their genome. And when we reconstructed them, they show a gross kinetic just the same as, um, as the, so this is the NO43 reference and these, so these proviruses just grow as good as the NO43. So they have a normal replication um, growth kinetics. And second, when we clone the LTRs into the luciferase reporter, we show that those proviruses that are coming from P20 negative wells 
and those with mutation, they actually have intact promoter function. They do not have CPG methylation at their promoter LTR, and they're integrated mostly into active transcription units, so indicating the lack of epigenic silencing in these proviruses. Therefore, these intact non-induced proviruses has a poor potential to become reactivated. So if we take a look at this, if we look at just DNA qPCR, we now know that we're just looking at these defective proviruses. If we use viral outgrowth assay to measure the size of the resin reservoir, it's probably one in a million. However, if we count these intact non-induced proviruses, then we found that those that do not come out from these viral outgrowth assays may actually contain an intact genome and the size of the reservoir may be bigger than what we thought. So why don't they come out? So to understand this, we take these P24 viral algorithms negative cultures and we stimulate them again with another round of maximum T cell activation with PHA. And we found that there are many wells that were, that were negative after three weeks of culture. If you stimulate them again, more viruses can come out. And this has been followed up with other studies showing that, yeah, so the more you stimulate them, something come out. So this means that despite maximum T cell activation, HIV may not be fully reactivated. And if you hit them multiple times, some may come out, and some may still um, like stay in this latent status. So this indicates that if we want to use shock and kill strategy just to, to provide a sterilizing cure, hoping that we reactivate every single provirus out from the patient, it's going to be a little bit challenging because what we're fighting against is the stochastic nature of HIV. So we started this journey as a molecular virologist, there are implications about these just pure sequencing. For example, as is done by my mentor, Bossacano, that because we now know the full and sequences of, of these like, proviruses that we looked at, so he used a mathematical program to test if he focused on two um, locations in the genome, can he predict that if one single provirus has both of these regions, can predict that this is an intact proviruses. The regions that he chose was one in pattern signal, the other in the ref response element. Um, so this part is in a TGG rich site, which is the hypermutations hotspot. So he designed probes again, the, these TGG sites. So if you have one single droplet, one provirus in there, it's positive for both packaging signal and the ref response element, and they are not hypermutated, he showed that there's a very good predictive value that this provirus will be rep will be likely to be genomically intact. So this was presented as a um, CROI talk, and if you are interested, you can go back to the CROI um, this year and just to look at the details. So this is how our knowledge on HIV sequencing can help us in the clinical application to a more feasible way to measure the size of a latent reservoir. And second, our repeated stimulation results, we can really expand this to see how many times that we need to purge out the yeast proviruses, the answer is that you stimulate them one, two, three, four times, you just get more and more things out. So this suggests that uh, if you want to do this in shock and kill, uh, it's going to take quite some time to preserve them out. The third application is that now these like full length proviral sequences can be, can be done in any labs who's interested that we don't, you don't need to send me samples. You, you are pretty much able to, everyone can pretty much do this. So using this, you are able to look at um, the, for example, the full length proviral sequence like populations in different subsets, such as TH1 enriched of full length proviral sequences, or transition memory cells enriched of full length proviral sequences, or any other subsets or interventions that you will be interested in. So that gives us um, um, some good indication that our understanding on sequences will help us for other clinical applications. I want to emphasize on this specific application that. Instead of using qPCR, what's the difference of using full length proviral sequencing and qPCR in these clinical trials? Full length proviral PCR is not very efficient and it's not that quantitative. It's very labor intensive. So, why do we do it? So, we do it because once we know the full length sequence, we are able to visualize all these footprints that the in vivo selection pressure leave on these HIV proviruses. Our, we got interested in this problem because we know that the latent reservoir don't decay very much, but we also know that when a patient is treated with antiretroviral therapy, after like four years of treatment, the DNA levels become stable. And then from Thor and Lisa's study, then we know that these their HIV infected cells they can undergo clonal expansion, so total HIV DNA levels stays the same. 
but colon expanded cells increase over time. So for us, there's some problem here. So why don't understand what happened? Why is that? So we think that cytotype T lymphocyte may play a role in shaping the, the HIV proviral landscape. There have been evidence showing that CKT cells is not only important in acute infection, but also um, during chronic infection. So we first used this fully proviral sequencing data to look at different subsets of proviruses in patients treated with antiretroviral therapy. We found that the longer the patient is infected with HIV, the fewer hypermutations they will have and the more large internal deletions they will have. So, hmm, why is that? To do that, we collaborated with Brad Jones at George Washington, now moving to Cornell. Um, we want to understand whether these defective proviruses would make any proteins and whether CKT cells can see them. So I gave a talk there and then he said, yeah, she actually have CKT cell clones. So for every HIV infected individual or all of us, we have some HOA types and there has been epitopes that's been mapped. For example, there are these like, nine amino acid, like ep epitopes, so starts I and GACL, GACL IK9 that is specifically presented by HOA B27. And he has these specific CKT cell clones. So if my defective proviruses would present the same exact amino acid stretch or epitope, and his CKT cells clone, which can only recognize this, becomes activated, then indicates the recognition of these, the production of defective proviruses. And this CKT cell recognition can be measured by CD107A expression by flow cytometry. So we, we sit together, we carefully chose certain clones that we have of sequences available, he has clones available, and then we found that when we transfect primary CD4 T cells with uh, clones containing defective packaging signal, we see that these cells can be recognized by cytotelic T cells, which is reasonable because they don't have the packaging signal, but they have the LTR, they have the GAP, they just make GAP proteins, and these can be produced and recognized. What is interesting is that, so we have some clones with apoback mediated hypermutations, and you remember, they create lots of premature stock codons. Although the, the epitope region is intact, there are premature star codons or a mutated star codon in this gene. So what happened? What happened is that when we transfect primary C4 T cells with these clones with hypermutations, they can still activate CD T cells and induce these recognition, which for us is very surprising. And those with large internal deletions, for example, those that have DACTLE deleted or they have tatin rat deleted, they can, not e they can either not make the epitope or they don't have a productive viral viral RNA production, then they are not that easily recognized by CJT cells. So this is what, I, what we think. The goal of CJT cells is to kill HIV infected cells containing infectious viruses. However, in the presence of these large amounts of defective proviruses, as we talk about there are 90% or more of these proviruses are actually defective, CJT cells may be distracted to kill these cells containing defective proviruses and then the killing of these um, uh, intact proviruses may be impaired. And we can do this using a competition assay called cold target in inhibition to see whether we see this distraction of these decoys from de defective proviruses or not. So we have um, primary C4 T cells infected with the uh, replication content HIV and we're throwing lots of cells with um, um, these defective proviruses and we show that if we add cells with packaging signal deletion defective proviruses, this distracts CD T cells from killing. Um, the real infectious, the real cells containing infectious proviruses. And when we have, we added cells containing the factor proviruses which have these hypermutations, that also causes distraction of CJT cells, indicating that these cells may be recognized by CJT cells and these may serve as decoys. To see whether this happens in patients, not just by transfection in, in plasma system, um, we take resting C4 T cells from patients and we induce their RNA, trans RNA transcription protein production using C3C28 in the presence of ART in the culture to prevent the uh, spread of the virus. So ideally, we will be able to see HIV RNA coming from intact or defective proviruses, for example, those with lots of hypermutations. And we do. So when we take resting CPR T cells and activate them, and we add CMV specific CDA T cells, which should not kill these. HIV infected cells, we see all these mutations, like they are hypermutations taking certain percentages in these cell associated HIV RNA. However, when we prime our CJ T cells with a GAC mixture of uh, this GRU B comes as a GAC mixture, it shows that these, when you add these 
HIV-specific CD T cells, these proportions of defective proviruses that are hypermutated, they're gone. So indicating that these cells producing hypermutated proviruses can be recognized by CD T cells even in an autologous site setting. Therefore, we propose that cytotype T lymphocytes may shape the landscape of HIV proviruses by preferential selection pressure on certain proviruses, such as those with hypermutations. And we propose that those with large internal deletions, especially those which do not make any viral proteins, they will not be recognized by CDA T cells, and over time, they will just accumulate, and that's why we can see this trend. So next, we're going to look at these HIV-infected cells one cell at a time to see how they persist. Um, it's from um, Thor, um, Lisa, and Jim's study, and also Fred Malone's and, and Stu Hughes study, that we know that back in 2014, there are these two papers that just intrigued us so much. So what they found is that HIV-infected cells may undergo clonal expansion, and they use these in HIV integration signs to, as a barcode to see where they're integrated. And they just, they are just a significant proportion of them and these clonally expanded cells would increase over time. And this is very scary for us because if HIV infected cells are increasing over time, that means that we're not going to cure HIV forever because they're just increasing. So we need to know what happened. So in these two studies, they both found out that while, for example, HIV, the regular human genome, if you say by certain definition, there's 5% of the genes that can be considered as cancer-related gene, these HIV integration sites has a significant higher proportion of integration into cancer-related genes than the regular proportion of cancer-related genes in human genome, um, which is, is found in both studies. So that is very interesting. Is HIV interacting with these cancer-related genes to promote persistence? First question. And the second question is that when they take a closer look into where these HIV integrated, not just that they're integrated into cancer-related genes, but also they are integrated in specific regions of these cancer-related genes. For example, during primary cell infections or like cell infection, you just take cells and throw virus in them. You do see HIV integrate into these genes, but it's integrated in a relatively random manner throughout the, the introns of this gene. However, in these sequences identified from just pure patient clones, they're all like scattered around this site immediately before the translation start site. And these, these four viruses, which are integrated into these specific sites, some undergo clonal expansion. There is just this distinct feature that what we see during in vitro infection is totally different from what it's seeing in vivo in the patients. So why, why is this and what is going on? We need to look back and think about this, like HIV integration to cancer related gene, what does that do? Then we need to remember that all the discovery of these oncogenes were actually discovered through our understanding in the old retroviruses. Although they are not HIV, it's been, it's been known that retroviruses can interact with these um, like cancer related genes. That, that's why there, is, there are all these oncogenes being developed. However, there has never been any single report saying that there is CD4 cancer in these HIV infected individuals. No, there isn't. But there is this enrichment in HIV and cancer related genes. And they're in these specific regions. So why is that? This just gives us lots and lots of questions to answer. The first question is, there are clonal expanded HIV infected cells. Do they contain infectious proviruses? We think that, yeah, 90% of these proviruses are defective. So I guess 90% of the chance these clonally infected cells must have defective proviruses by, just by math. The answer is no. So there are three separate groups who did uh, similar studies. They just take a patient blood and then just do lots of viral outgrowth assays, just lots and lots of them. And they try to look at these viruses and then if their viral sequence is the same, for example, in envelope or in the Nepal region, then they say, oh, they're coming out from clonal expansion. But these which grow out from viral outgrowth cultures should be all replication competent. So this is uh, done by, whose tree is this? This is Nina Hasmani and Bob's tree. And this is, and so this is John Bowie and John Meller's tree. And this is uh, Michelle Newsom's analysis 
what they all found is that if you look at these colon expanded ones, if, uh, if they look at these the replicants that have HIV and then you, you group them, you, you found that approximately more than 50% of these replication contact HIV are coming out from certain clones. So these clone expanded cells may contain a significant amount of infectious HIV. And that is very scary. They are not only infectious, but also colon expanding. So there, we think that there is an in vivo mechanism or selection pressure that promotes the persistence of these very special cells in special locations that cannot be captured during in vitro infection. And then, so do HMV integration sites matter? There are two hypotheses. One is that HIV integration site doesn't matter. HIV infected cells has its own program that can promote the survival of these HIV infected cells. So this paper was recently published by um, a Michelle Nusen's vice group saying that when they take um, cells from HIV infected individuals and look at their transcriptome, there are certain genes that can be identified through heat map and anticipated plot and Q values and showing that these genes may suggest a survival preference. But if you look at them, it's not really a clear cut that some cells use this and some cells use that. It's, it, there could be a transcript signature that is associated with the survival of these CD4 T cells. Or recently, Matthias Lichterfeld published this paper showing that uh, using OX40, and then, which is related to BRC5, that OX40 positive cells may have more intact HIV progresses, which is this red bar over here. Uh, it's, it's interesting because, so they show clonal expanded HIV and intact HIV, but because of the rarity of these infected, infected cells containing HIV, there's still no answer whether these clonally, in, the proportion of clonally intact HIV is higher or lower in OX40 positive or negative cells. But there is indeed studies trying to find out what is the cellular program that HIV uses to promote a persistence and survival of the CD4 T cells. I'm going to show you this, another interesting study, which is highly relevant to um, the Fred Hutch Institute, which have a specific focus on CAR Ts. So this was published last week in Nature um, by Cartoon, Berkushman, and others. They didn't do CD4s. They take CD4 T cells and CAR T them, and they look at the integration site and they found that there is this specific clone that after infusion, it just take over the majority of the population. So there's just a whole lot of this. And why is that? Why is this clone being so good in this patient's cancer was controlled better within the presence of this clone? So they found that this clone contains a lentivirus integrated into this gene called TET2. And this TET2 gene is interesting because there are two alleles one allele is already mutated, having a missense mutation. And the other allele, which this lentivirus is integrated in, jumps in the middle and disrupts the microRNA binding sites. So it becomes constitutively active. And that is the reason why they think that this clone persists in this patient. And integration into a proliferation-related gene totally reminds us about HIV. What if HIV is doing something similar through integration into certain sites and produce these in vivo proliferations that we don't really understand? To look at them, we really need to pull out these cells from patients. And so this, because this gives us an answer in vivo, not in vitro. Yes, the first challenge is that there is no reliable marker which can identify infected cells from HIV infected individuals. And the second challenge is that although we were able to look at these HIV full length sequencing, when we use nested PCR to look at these viral sequences, we lost the information of the integration site. And when uh, people use uh, sharing methods to look at HIV integration site, the sharing will disrupt the HIV proviral genome. So then we no longer understand whether it's intact and intact into certain genes that these two informations just don't go together. There are other people who use viral algorithm culture to look at these colon expansion. However, after two, three weeks of these viral algorithm culture, these cells are all undergoing in vitro new rounds of infection and the integration site no longer represents what we see in vivo. The solution is we look at HIV RNA instead. We take HIV host chimeric RNA junctions as our indicator to identify HIV infected site. So first we want to identify 
HIV infected cells. We use the expression of HIV RNA expression as a surrogate to find these cells. And second, we find the genes in which is integrated um, using this HIV host chimera RNA junction. And we can also look at the cellular environment because these cells express RNA, we can look at their cellular RNA expression. This method, HIV RNA sort seek, we use the RNA preserving method to identify HIV infected cells from infected individuals under suppressive antiviral viral therapy. Briefly, we take resin fever T cells from patients under antiviral viral therapy and we activate them with PMA itomycin um, for 16 to 18, 18 hours in the presence of ART to induce RNA production. Once they have RNA production, we fix and permeabilize them to do this first in situ hybridization. We have 96 probes targeting five prime HIV, another 96 probes targeting three prime HIV, then we can visualize these cells and sort them out for single cell RNA seq using just a full cytometer. As we shown here, that we can identify these cells that are positive for both five prime and three prime HIV RNA in cells that are infected with NO43 reference strain and in other clinical isolates, showing our ability to identify HIV infected cells using this method. We use a very stringent gating on HIV on infected cells to make sure our gating is correct. When it comes to patient samples, it becomes very tricky because there's only one to 10 per million C4 T cells containing these inducible HIV. So there are just very, very few dots, but we're able to store these HIV infected cells. You can see them, right? You see that? You see that? Yeah, you can, okay. Yeah, so we can see them. Well, if, if we don't see them, the, the sort, sorter will see them. So we just sort them out for a single cell RNA seq. So from seven ART treated individuals, we identify um, 16 HIV host chimera RNA and 20 single positive uh, cells. They don't ask me why I don't have 20, not 200. It's really, really hard because of the rarity of these HIV in infected cells, individuals, so we can look at them. So first we sorted them out. We want to know that if they're really HIV infected cells instead of uninfected cells or non-specific sorting. So we look at their HIV RNA landscape and we constructed them. We found that there's no APOBAT mediated hypermutation in these ones and they have intact package signal or splice donor sites, and they contain authentic HIV RNA sequences as shown here in what the stretch of the envelope that can be phylogenetically categorized into different individuals. So we believe that these HIV RNA source positive cells contain intact, inducible HIV proviruses. And second, we look at where they are integrated. Are they integrated into cancer-related genes? So we, we want to know this, but um, we, we want to know how this works. So then. We collaborated with Rick Bushman, who has an, a, a different, but it's also a, a list of genes who are categorized as um, cancer-related genes. So with this list of 200, um, 2,983 cancer-related genes, we look at the frequency of these, say, cancer-related genes in the human genome, say 11%, compare with the HIV DNA integration sites, so this is the Frank Mattarelli data, and our HIV host chimera RNA identified from our HIV RNA short seek. So we do see an enrichment of these cancer-related genes, not only in Frank Malley's study in HIV integration site, but also in our HIV RNA short C data, indicating that these cells expressing um, HIV RNA containing induced proviruses are integrated into cancer-related genes. And this is also true in primary cell infection, though. This is with using Rick, um, Rick Bushman and Scott's data back in 2015. Then we're wondering what happens. Is there a control for us to see this effect? So we look at housekeeping genes. So from this list of 3,000 housekeeping genes, and we found that, well, this trend is also true in housekeeping genes. So integration into cancer-related gene itself may not fully explain um, it, like clonal expansion. It, this mostly reflects the nature of uh, HIV integration to active transcription units. And there's something else behind just this category as cancer-related genes. So we um, think about HIV host interactions like how these oncogenes interact with the genome. So we collaborated with uh, Maela Pertia, Ellis, Ellis, and to look at these HIV integration sites. And these analysis are basically their bioinformatic analysis they give us a 200 integration sites. And then Jimmy and I, so Jimmy and I, uh, we look at them by eye. So by eye, I mean, do you see as a genome browser, HIV aligned in NCBI blast, for example, just to see we want to see the exact junction just to make sure that these are authentic um, integration sites, not just uh, artifacts that are picked up by these bioinformatic pipelines. So we have a strength-specific library preparation method so that we can identify 
the positive sense RNA. And then we will be able to know in these sequences whether it's HIV driving the transcription or it's the host driving the transcription. So when HIV is integrated into convergent orientation, we found that in six out of six cases, it's H3 prime LTR, which dominates in these cases and drives the transcription of uh, antisense host uh, RNA. We still don't know the role of this, whether it does something or nothing, we don't know, but it's the three prime LTR which dominates. When HIV is integrated in the same orientation, then either the host can drive a read through into HIV or the HIV can drive the read through into the host. And we see this in several genes, for example, in mTOR, which we think is interesting. The more interesting thing is that when HIV is integrated in the same orientation, HIV has these awesome splice sites. It can be a splice donor and a splice acceptor. And we found that when this HIV is integrating the host gene, we found the exact junction of an exon. Here is the exon. At the end of this exon, where we see this on UCSC genome browser, this exon ends, it's about to splice into the, the next exon of this host gene. Instead, it splices into HIV splice receptor, which is the splice receptor A5 that is already been known and as well characterized the canonical splice sites. So they just splice together, and it's splicing together, potentially creating a cancer-related gene fusing to a region that's coming out from HIV, for example, in the TAT region. And for example, this gene, Python 1, is associated with DNA sensing and it's um, also controlling cell cycle. So it would be interesting for us to understand what these chimeric RNA do and what chimeric proteins that they make. And what is even more interesting, HIV has a dominant splice donor called a major splice donor. You have this major splice donor and when we, what we see is that when there is the RNA reads till here, instead of splicing into HIV splice receptor or just reading through this unsplice HIV, it splices into the exon at the exact exon junction of certain known genes. For example, this gene is called BAC2. I hope that you guys will know this. So it splices exactly at the exon junction at this BAC2 exon 6 immediately before the star codon. And this is a, a feasible consequence of the integration site of all, all these sites that have been previously mapped out. So it's HIV which drives the production in, of these BAC2 through HIV-driven splicing. And so this is interesting. But we found another gene called NFAT-C3. So NFAT has several forms, but NFAT has been an evolving T cell activation, and which is also very important in HIV reactivation. We found that there is this HIV host chimera right here, which can be a consequence of these integration sites that have been previously found. And this site has been associated with clonal expansion in Frank Malorelli's um, study. So we found that NFAT integrates in the middle of this NFAT. So HIV integrates into NFAT, not at the beginning, in the middle of NFAT. And what happened? What happened is that, so Jimmy, look at this. We want to know what HIV does when it's cutting in the middle of a gene. So these are single cells that we found from these patients. And we look at the transcription of this NFAT C3. So these are the axons of NFAT C3. In cells that we know that HIV is not integrated into NFAT C3, we found that the transcription of these axons remains intact. However, in this specific cell, which we know that HIV integrates into this NFAT C3, the transcription of this NFAT after integration site is okay. But the transcription before this is totally gone, indicating that HIV dominates at this site and promote and controls the transcription of this NFAT. It's driven by HIV instead of by the NFAT promoter, by the host. So how much is this? It's actually quite a lot. So we found that this HIV-driven NFAT transcription is a lot compared with the general transcription level of the cell that the cellular, cellular housekeeping gene level may not be as high as this. So this is a lot of transcription. And then what we found is that there are a lot of HIV being transcribed, but there are chimeras being transcribed, but then the CD4 T cell activation markers, such as CD69 and CD25, are actually pretty low and we don't know why. And then the third thing is we know that HIV used up this major splice donor, 
to splice into this axon from this MFAC3. So then the majority of this HIV genome is to skip out, so they are not being transcribed. However, we see a lot of HIV RNA reads even in these regions. And why is that? So our post Arinja analyzed this RNA transcription landscape, and he, she found that while HIV can use this major splice donor or other splice sites to splice into these cellular genes, HIV can also activate other known canonical alternate splice sites. So these are like the so D1A, A2, D2 kind of known splice sites, as well as other unknown cryptic sites to produce spliced RNA. So one promoter, HIV, drives the production of two things. One, the host gene. Two, HIV itself. So through alternative splicing and like the dominance in transcriminal interference. So when we look at these 20 single cells that we have, we found that the HIV RNA level follows a gradient or analog distribution. You can, you can rate them from like lower to higher. However, when you look at T cell activation level of the certain genes that we look at, T cell activation follows this or non-phenotype. It has, been, it has been known by Mark Davis' work that T cell activation follows this digital distribution that you need to meet certain threshold to, to turn it on or off. So we feel that, for example, in this cell with a lot of HIV being produced and it's integrated into MFAT, then it somehow through inter interaction with this MFAT pathway and down regulates the CD, the T cell activation. And we feel that this could be the way that HIV, HIV will down regulate your new presentation. So this is our, our hypothesis. We propose that um, during HIV infection, if the cell contain a replication comp in HIV, it will make lots of virus, viral proteins that's cytotoxic to the cells, and a full-blown T cell activation will lead to the cell death of these cells. However, when HIV can drive the transcription at certain specific sites, then during T cell activation, uh, they can drive the cellular machinery uh, to modulate these either RNA transcription level for the host gene or the HIV itself and then promote the cellular survival. If you reduce T cell activation or you reduce the level of HIV RNA reporting production, you may decrease immune recognition and therefore there might be an in vivo benefit for these cells to persist. So with that, I would like to thank Bob and Janet, who's my mentors, my collaborators as biopraticians. I really started my new family here at Yale and Walter Pretty and Richard Sutton during Spudish. They really helped me a lot setting up my own lab. So this is my lab. Um, and this is Jack, my PhD student, my two postdoc who did the bioinformatic analysis. They are work, so Jensha has been working on sort of C, basically she sits in front of the sorter very often until 10.30 or 11 o'clock at night. Um, so we also thank our collaborators in funding and all study participants. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Time for this. Um, so, so you saw I had, I had two receptor down regulation uh -huh. in the cells with the NFAT C3 yeah. integration. Uh, what do you think about uh, cytokine receptors for homeostatic cytokines? How, how do you think this? Do you think these cells get to be independent of homeostatic signals for proliferation, and, or do you think they're still dependent on that? We look at IL-7 receptor, for example, in our release data. Oh, okay. So the question is um, whether homocyte proliferation, proliferation receptors are affected. So we look at their RNA-seq data, and then we don't have a conclusion yet because of the limited number of cells that we look at. But we also found that so HIV infection or T cell activation actually downregulates IL-7 receptor. So I am not very sure if I have answer right now, but we are very interested. Question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so maybe I missed this because I have been uh, in the technology. It, do you have ideas for how to get at this idea of preferential integration or overrepresented integration versus overrepresented proliferation in this factor? Or how to disentangle those two mechanisms for why this ends up being overrepresented in the end? Okay, so the question is, um, um, what are the thoughts about preferential integration or preferential enrichment? I think there are two um, experts sitting in front of you. Um, 
And what, what I thought, my, my personal thought is that um, if there is preferential integration, we should see them during in vitro infection. And in vitro infection, we see that, yeah, so integration into BAC2 is okay, like you see them, it's not exclusive, so integration is okay. But enrichment into specific site is different. So I would prefer more on the enrichment instead of the preferential integration in the in vivo context. And in this um, preferential enrichment in, in vivo, I would say, and there are three forces we're thinking about, antigen-driven proliferation, homeostatic proliferation, and HIV-driven proliferation. I think that the first two, homeostatic proliferation and antigen-driven proliferation, still plays a lot of the role that it happens every day. But it's that there's, there's just in, during this, well, I still don't know whether HIV drive this. I believe that every cell's intact or defective, uh, wherever they're integrated, they face the same uh, activation every day in antigen, but some cells survive. And over, the, over time, some may just um, stand out and stay longer. And that's why we see this enrichment. And so the next step is to target them. So that's why we're interested in anti-proliferative responses, because now that we know them, we need to target them. Just, just say, we spent a lot of time trying to look, uh, see whether or not there was any evidence of different patterns of integration in vitro versus in vivo. And there's really no evidence that there is. You know, it, it, it related to the level of transcription of the gene. Uh, integration occurs in the, you know, most of it occurs near the five prime end of the gene, but not at the transcription of the start site uh, in vitro and in vivo. Uh, it's really the survival of the cell and the integration of the cell that distinguishes the two. Yeah, so we've been working on the survival of C4 T cells, and that's sort of important. Yeah. So, I, I, very, very elegant work, and I'm wondering how many different pathways do you think there are? How many different integration sites are going to affect the cell physiology so that the cell survives? Uh, so the question is how many pathways so there are. So we can target how, how many cell, how many pathways do we need to target? The answer is that from this huge supplement that you have in science, I don't know how many we're going to target. We want to target all of them. The reality is no, we may not. So we're trying to figure out are there common ways that we can target all of them. For example, that's why chromatin structure may play a role or certain cancer pathways may play a role, but we don't know. We hope we know, but by the end, it could be that HIV just outweighed all of us, which would be sad. <laughs> we need to be smarter. So the, the, the lovely data showed that the CPL shape profile is not the same. Isn't it a pretty good cover to whether you think the CPL shape just the intact profile is the same? And so the subsets or types of cells are the same. So the question is, how does how, how do CDLs do to cells containing infectious HIV and how does that change the landscape? Um, yeah, CDL does just change those whole landscape because we see escapes. So the way to look at them is to just grow them out and to see what the escape look like. And then over time, you do see these, these, this, it's, the, the CDL escape epitopes become a dominant in these, these people. I mean, like, yes, so CDA T cells shape not only the defective ones, but those with intact ones just similarly. Do you think that that we measure so the, the majority of the intact viruses were derived from formerly responding cells? Is it more than two percent? Um, that's and what kind of, uh -huh. data shows. Um, and so, so do you think that's just a, a problem of measuring it because we want to see intact, intact viruses in formerly responding populations? Or how reliable is that? Okay, so the question, yes, the question is, um, colon expanded cells, 50% uh, of them, so 50 of 50 percent of these replication of HIV coming from colon expanded cells from like three studies, and is it really 50%? So this this sentence is really mouthful. Replication replication combined HIV virus, 50 of them come from colon expanded cells, but I'm not saying that 50% of the HIV are intact and colon expanding. That's not the right no, no, statement. No, no, the so. So yes, yes. So if we, we use a method focusing on viral outgrowth, you will pick up those and you look at where they are. But then if you use, for example, full end sequencing, you say they're mostly defective, so you don't pick up those. Let's drill down on that a little bit. It's fifty percent of the virus coming out yeah. is coming from these colonies. Yes. 
to look at the tree. Yes. And you say, which, uh, how many different cells are producing virus? And mm -hmm. how many cells are slowly proliferating amongst mm -hmm. that total? It's, it's less than 50. So, far less than 50. So, thank you. Yeah, so, yes, so let's look at the trees if we have them. Almost, almost there. Okay, so these are the trees. So the question is that how many are those are actually coming from colonial expanded ones? The answer is that it's patient, it's, it's different in each patient. So these are just three representative trees that we, we see from these three studies. For example, this one is published by Bob. Look at this patient, S, S07. There's no colonial expansion at all, SOA, no colonial expansion at all. And then some others, for example, this one, that's been caught by Michonne. This is why this clone proliferate like this much, but look at these regions, they're not really clone expanded. And, and, and that's the other issue. I mean, the, the sampling on there was so minimal, you couldn't really tell. But if you look at, let's say, the loosen spike one, you see one, two clones, or three clones, yeah. responsible for 50% of the virus. But all of those things are producing virus. So it's really, you know, three out of 30. So, but I mean, when did you ever see three total independent studies coming up with numbers that are that low, saying the exact same thing? And that to me is ridiculous because it's like they talk to each other. They, they, they do talk. <laughs> <laughs> but they talk after they have data. They can't just. <laughs> it's like that bad. It's just like, oh my God. If that's not true, then that, that, I think that's practically well, not true. They, they said, you know, it could be. Uh, function of the time they've been on therapy because a, a paper that doesn't get cited hardly at all is this lab now 2013 okay, <laughs> which uh, shows that the number yes the number of total number of cells that are uh, infected with HIV stays about the same but the number of unique total number of uh, unique cells goes down quite rapidly and they're replaced by the people yeah. So if you look at this kind of pattern in different stages of infection, you'll see different things. Yeah. You're, you're, just, yeah, your diagram that was on the front of your paper in cell versus micro shows sort of the same thing. Yeah. 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 So there, there's a dynamic change there. I just want to make the point that if I think everybody knows this, but if you observe a single sequence on a tree, it doesn't uh, look like it. Right. Yeah. Uh, So it's so limitation in So this is in effect the lowest estimate in terms of data. Uh, so unless, unless there's some problem with how we're finding these disclosures, but assuming that they're both fluid clones, the observed singlets go down. Yeah. 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 About an old good thing. You talked about the uh, hypermutated sequences giving rise to epitopes. And, um, but have you actually shown that there are stop codons in the same protein upstream of the epitope? Because you show, you show the epitope with stop codons on either side. I just want to know are you? Postulating some kind of stop codon suppression occurring uh, to produce that epitope, or are you talking about stop codons in different proteins? Okay, so the question is, what? Why do we see proteins with those stop codons? The answer is, we can only use CDAT cells to to recognize them, but we cannot Western blot them because they don't make those Western blot epitopes. And then we ideally should mass spec them, but we were trying to see that no one wants to do this mass spec for us because they don't know what to expect. So we would suppose that there are certain read-throughs with this stop codon, just like the VPU and the envelope sequences, that there are some leaky things going through. And the, these are recognized and made because of drip, because it's a defective ribosome of products that they're, they're still making made, but they're not the exact protein that is cell expecting, so they're degraded and then presented. Does have comments? Apoback mutation? Um, so yeah, so Apoback 3G mutates the hospitalized TGG, which is tryptophan coding residue. If you mutate either G into A, you create a stop codon. Right, that's for molecule, right? So you can 
doesn't act on every mRNA molecule in this translation. Well, you get mRNA, but they may some may decay, but you get translated. But there are stop codons all the way through. It's not just a few of them. There are a lot of them throughout. Thor, Thor, you've got a question. Oh, I was going to ask one thing we never really went back and tried to focus on was the integrated side of the unique viruses. And so those clonal proliferating cells are proliferating, and that seems to be why they survive. One can imagine other mechanisms that would allow a cell to survive, preferential survival, or um, masking in them from the immune system, or some other characteristic that doesn't really drive preferential proliferation, but for some reason they survive. And there may be other mechanisms the integrated site affects, but we never, those are harder to do, and certainly we need a lot of integration. Yeah, you, yes, you guys have more integration sites than I do, so I hope you can tell us the answer. We don't know. And, um, did I get it right that you were showing that um, infected, um, there are cells that are infected with uh, defective proviruses are preferentially targeted by CCL? Hypermutated ones are, but large, those with large internal deletions in our hands are not that, so they would. They, they, there will be a lot of them over time, but hypermutes, some may be recognized. So you would expect over time that you'd be seeing more infected virus and more with large internal deletions? Yes. And I wonder, has that been observed or has that had changed? Um, there are, so for example, the ones that we had are cross-sessional, and I know there are people trying to look at this using longitudinal data. There's a CROI abstract by Jonathan Lee and Matthias Lichtenfeld's group. So it's Jonathan Lee's actually, so CROI. There's a CROI abstract looking at that. Um, I, I, don't, I don't remember their exact number, but I think that th those defective ones do like, expand and increase over time. Just to clarify, all your CCL data was with the cells that have been transfected with RNA, RNA, or transfected with DNA so those CDA T cell data, they got collaborating with the specific T cell clones, those are transfected. But then those data, they're coming out just from patient cells. Those are just bulk CDA T cells. So stimulate them this way and see for T cells, you activate them that way and put together to see the change in their hypermutation RNA. So this data I'm showing right now is in totally ex vivo, no plasmids involved. I think we'll stop there. So if everybody can join me in thanking Dr. Ho. Thank you.